You don't have time for long intros. You want to read books, read them fast, and get your Goodreads challenge. Now, personally, I sometimes find it uh, quite hard to read a lot during the upcoming festivities. So here's a little list of excellent books, all under 200 pages, that you can read in one sitting or one day. Let's get into it. First one up is The Uncommon Reader by Alan Bennett. Now, this is a fun one. It is a story about um, the former British Queen, Queen Elizabeth II. Now, a lot of people seem to think that this is a real story, but rest assured, this is fiction. Now, on one autumn morning, um, the Queen is walking her uh, corgis outside Buckingham Palace uh, when she meets a traveling library. More out of social pressure than anything else, she takes home a book. Now the next week she takes home another book and then another and all of a sudden Queen Elizabeth II has become an avid reader. And as we know books tend to do, she becomes obsessed with it. There's books everywhere around Buckingham Palace, um, she starts to neglect her royal duties and even in her royal address to the public she starts talking about books um, and giving people book recommendations. Now this drives her on royal entourage absolutely bonkers and they um, start this scheme to gather up books. This is a really funny read and one of those books that you can finish in an afternoon's time. It is time very well spent and I absolutely recommend this one. The Uncommon Reader by Aaron Bennett. The next book is possibly one of my absolute favorite books by Neil Gaiman and with only 195 pages this book can fit any busy schedule. This is the absolutely delicious The Ocean at the End of the Lane. This beautiful story is a story about a man who returns to his childhood home um, to attend a funeral. Now the home itself is long gone, but he visits a farm um, that he used to visit a lot when he was a child. It is the farm where we met his childhood friend Letty, an extraordinary girl who took him on all kinds of adventures. Now as he sits in thought um, at a pond behind the old farmhouse, his past and his childhood and all of these memories come flooding back. And he's transported back to a vivid and strange world that can only exist in a child's mind. This is an enchanting story about the reality children live in. The kind of reality that makes you believe that if you dig a hole deep enough, you can surface at the other side of the world. A reality full of imagination. The same imagination that transforms a pond into an ocean. A reality that adults don't always understand. A reality that a lot of us have lost or at least we think we have lost. This is an absolutely gorgeous book. It is about the power of stories, the power of imagination and how it shelters us from dangers and darkness inside and outside of us. It is a story about growing up, about being a human and about never wanting to lose that childlike imagination. This is Gaiman at his best. He is a master storyteller with a knack for the darker and fantastical. The Ocean at the End of the Lane is one of my personal all-time favorites. Pick it up and be transformed to a world of wonder. Neil Gaiman with The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Next one up is a modern classic. Only 110 pages and loved all over the world. It is The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. Now this novella is a special one. It is the story of a young Latina girl growing up in Chicago. She imagines what she is and what she's going to become. It is a story about navigating life, about teenage angst, but also about being an Hispanic girl. It is no wonder that this book has become a loud voice in the Hispanic community. The story itself is told in a series of vignettes, shorter stories that sometimes are heartbreaking and at other times are absolutely funny. But it is more than just a coming of age story. Sandra Cisneros, the author, is also a poet and this absolutely shows in this book. The words and sentences flow with a remarkable cadence that only a poet can conjure up. It is an absolute joy to read. The different vignettes make excellent bite-sized portions to read in just half an hour or even an hour. The story itself is remarkable, but it will be Mango Street that you fall in love with. So, The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros, our third recommendation for today. Then let's throw in some historical fiction. We Travel by Jean Ekenos. Now, this book has been a bestseller in France for many years now. And just shy of 200 pages, this book is all about the last 10 years 
of musical genius Maurice Ravel. You might know him from this tune. The story starts in 1927. Maurice Ravel is embarking on a grand tour to the United States and he's becoming a bit of a famous composer. He proves to be the quirky musician. He's a dandy, he's eccentric and he's a bit of a, a grump really. Now this tour, which lasts about four months I think, takes a lot of him. And from there on on, he starts to get old. These are his last 10 years all the way up to the moment that he dies and it is a bit of a sad story. It is a story about an old man who has to say goodbye um, to a lot of people that he loves, who isn't capable anymore of keeping up with the rhythm and the pace of life and at the end goes into the night quite reluctantly. I think this book is a really realistic and painful evocation of those last years of a musical genius. It is a quick read and I absolutely recommend it to you if you're into classical music or just want to read more about historical figures. I will happily admit that I didn't know much about Maurice Ravel before starting reading this book, so I found it very interesting to see how certain pieces that you know very well come to life and how they are written. So if that sounds right up your alley, why not pick up this one? Ravel by Jean Ekenos. Can we get shorter? Yes, we can. 86 pages, Notes on Grief by Chiamanda Adichie. It is the summer of 2020 and the COVID-19 epidemic rages all over the world. It keeps families separated from each other and it is at this time that the author's father dies. Initially, she writes a piece for the New Yorker about his loss and his grief but it becomes so much more because she discovers that if there is one emotion that we all seem to share, it is the grief and the loss of a loved one. She starts to tell about her own journey of loss and grief, but soon it becomes so much more. It becomes a timepiece of millions of people all around the world, all at once grieving for lost ones. All across cultural and linguistic borders, she finds that grief has become uh, all about language, about the lack of language, about searching for the right words, but also about a shared language. Something that we all feel. And it has become a very beautiful book. It is eloquent, it is painful, it is emotional, but it is also timeless. I think this book might become a timeless classic for the ages. I suspect you will rip through it and then go back to separate pieces to reread them and think on them some more. Notes on Grief by Chimamanda Adichie is an absolute gem. Let's go for 164 pages of spooky mystery. This is the much loved We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. This story is written in the voice of Mary Cat Blackwood, a young 18 year old girl who lives in an stately castle with her agoraphobic sister and her ailing uncle. Many years before um, the story that she tells, the family hit a bit of a tragic event. An event in which most of her family got poisoned by arsenic and only the three of them survived. This got them really alienated from an already small village with a lot of whispers and rumors going on about who actually poisoned the family. It is a mystery novel and I must say it is one that I found quite easy to solve. But that didn't diminish any fun. This book is all about the quirky and gloomy and dark characters that are actually funny and very interesting to read about. There's Uncle Julian who was left a cripple after the poisoning and he's absolutely obsessed with the event that killed off his family. Then there's Constance, a young woman who was actually one of the people to cook on the fateful day. She's considered to be a poisoner in the eyes of the village and never goes out because of it. And then there's Maricat herself. Sent to her room without dinner on the day of a poisoning, she's a bit of the link between the outside world and the inhabitants of the castle. And from there on on, it is a quest to find out what actually happens to this very scorned and very hated family of the Blackwoods. It is a dark and gloomy and atmospheric tale, but it is an absolute joy to read. Published in 1962 as the last book of the beloved author Shirley Jackson, this book has quickly become a contemporary classic. So if you're fed up with all of the tinsel and joy of the festivities and you want some gloomy, darker counterpart for that, then this is the book for you. We have always lived in the castle 
by Shirley Jackson. And since we're talking classics, let's add another one with Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Our main character, Guy Montag, is a fireman. A fireman in a dystopian future whose job it is to burn down um, the one thing that is forbidden the most. Books, printed books and the houses he can find them in. Now he never questions his job, he just does it, then returns back home to his bland, boring wife to sit in front of the television and just mindlessly consume. All up to the day that he meets Clarissa, a new young neighbor who introduces him to a world, a past where people were not fearful of books and knowledge. And this is of course a very slippery slope, because Montag starts to question everything around him and starts to have ideas of his own. No longer does he echo the mindless chatter on the television, but he starts to be an individual. Now just shy of 200 pages, and this book is an absolutely classic of dystopian literature. And I must say that for me Fahrenheit is one of the most scary dystopian books because this is not about Big Brother, about an evil government who tries to uh, keep people down. No, this is about people willfully giving up their freedom of thought just for a bit of mindless comfort. You could almost say that this is not a dystopian future. This is a dystopian present. And that's a bleak thought to have. But still, this book is a pleasure to read. The language is unpretentious, it is clear, it is dark and at times poetic when needed. This book goes from dystopian horror to being an, an excellent character study to being an action book at times. So if you haven't read it yet or you need a good reread, then by all means, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury is the way to go. And then, last but certainly not least, 197 pages written by James Baldwin, it is time that we talk about If Beale Street Could Talk. Now, I've been in love with James Baldwin's writing ever since I read Giovanni's Room, but If Beale Street Could Talk is a different kind of book. It is a raw book, powerful and full of outrage. It is the story of two young black people living in New York. Tish and Fanny are respecting a child and everything is going well. And the love that they share is a very passionate but also a very pure and beautiful one. Yes, you could say that this is a love story, but it is a love story written by James Baldwin. Fanny gets falsely accused by a racist policeman and gets thrown into jail. And all of a sudden, this isn't just a book about love anymore. No, this book becomes an outcry. Outrage against the injustice of the system. Anger with an America where people can be thrown into jail just because of the color of their skin. A book that you could say was written in the past, but is still very now today. James Baldwin does not paint a pretty picture. It is a world of bigotry, a world of a brutal justice system, a world where people are indifferent at best and absolutely racist at their worst. It is an ugly world and it is almost impossible to believe that something as beautiful and as pure as the love between Tish and Fanny can exist. James Baldwin has written a gripping modern classic with this one. It is a book that grabs you by the throat and kicks you a conscience. Just shy of 200 rage-filled pages, I absolutely recommend this book to anyone who wants to listen to it. And that's it for today. Great books all under a 200 pages mark. Books you can easily read in an afternoon or one sitting. And now I want to hear from you. Have you read any of these? Do you like novellas? Let me know down below in the comments and we'll talk shorter books some more. And if you don't know what to comment but you still want to support this video, you can comment a clock emoji because, you know, time is money. That's it for me for this week. Thank you for watching. Do leave a comment, do leave a like, and if you need some more bookish recommendations, you can always go here.